Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms virtual conversation today on religious freedom conditions in Afghanistan, focusing particularly on the plight of two religious minority communities in Afghanistan that are nearing extinction. My name is Dwight Bashir, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Policy at USERF. For those of you not familiar with us, uh, USERF is an independent, bipartisan U.S. federal government body created by the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, also known as IRFA, to monitor religious freedom abroad and to make policy recommendations to the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, and Congress. Our work is led by nine commissioners appointed by the President and the leadership of both political parties in the House of Representatives and the Senate, and is supported by a professional staff of about 20. In April, President Biden announced the drawdown of U.S. troops in Afghanistan beginning May 1st and concluding by September 11th, 2021, just in a short time, marking the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks that led to the U.S. invasion in Afghanistan. This announcement has uh, reawakened sentiments of fear and anxiety amid uh, ethnic and religious minorities in Afghanistan who have been targeted for their faith by extremist elements such as the Taliban and the Islamic State in the Khorasan province, also known as uh, ISIS-K, who are downright hostile to and overtly opposed to religious diversity in the country. I'm joined today by USERF Chair Nadine Mayenza and Commissioner Fred Davey. Uh, today's event will begin with opening remarks from Chair Mayenza, who will briefly speak about uh, USERF's concerns regarding the uptick in violence and its impact on religious freedom in Afghanistan. And then Commissioner Davey will discuss some of USERF's 2000, 2021 recommendations to the US government uh, to advance religious freedom in Afghanistan. We will then hear from Dr. Jagbir Juti Johal from the University of Birmingham on the exodus of the Sikh and Hindu communities from Afghanistan. And then uh, we'll hear from Michael Kugelman, the Deputy Director of the Asia Program and Senior Associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center, uh, who will discuss uh, actionable recommendations to the United States government to protect these communities prior to and post withdrawal. Afterwards, I'll moderate a brief conversation among the speakers with some opening questions. Then there'll be some time for questions from the audience. To ask a question, please use the Zoom webinars uh, Q&A function, as you see at the bottom of uh, your screen in the center, uh, to submit your question in writing, which you can actually do at any time uh, during the event starting now. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Chair of USERF, uh, Nadine Mayenza. Thank you, Dwight. And many thanks to those of you who have joined us today for this important discussion. Despite landmark strides towards peace, security concern, conditions have failed to improve in Afghanistan, particularly for the Sikh, Hindu, and Hazara Shia religious minorities, among others. An increase in attacks by extremist groups, most notably ISIS-K and the Taliban, not only threat, threaten Afghanistan's overall stability, but also have decimated religious minorities, particularly the Sikh community, which faces near extinction in Afghanistan. The Afghan government's limited control over the country's territory and lack of capacity within the areas it does control continue to hamper its ability to protect its citizens. USERF recommended in our 2021 annual report that the US Department of State place Afghanistan on a special watch list for engaging in or tolerating severe violations of religious freedom pursuant to the International Religious Freedom Act and continue to designate the Taliban as an entity of particular concern or an EPC for engaging in systematic ongoing and egregious violations of religious freedom as defined by IRFA. Anti-government non-state actors, including ISIS-K and the Taliban, have claimed responsibility for some of the deadliest attacks. The UN reported that the Taliban responsible for 45% of civilian casualties during 2020. While the Taliban rejected these findings and denied responsibility for involvement in attacks targeting civilians, particularly the religious minority communities, the Afghan government alleges that the Taliban uses Islamist militant groups as proxies and continues to target pro-government Muslim leaders, institutions, and leaders of faith throughout the country. Although their use of anti-minority rhetoric has diminished, reports in Indicate that the Taliban continue to exclude religious minorities and punish residents in areas under their control in accordance with their extreme interpretation of Islamic law. As we approach complete withdrawal from Afghanistan by U.S. troops, 
we should reflect upon the conditions and the obstacles that religious minorities endure when the Taliban was in power. I will now turn to Commissioner Fred Davey to introduce a short video on this point and speak on additional use of recommendations to the US government and Congress on opportunities to support religious minorities in Afghanistan. Thank you, Chair Mainza. And I want to join you in thanking our panel of distinguished guests, as well as our audience for engaging in this extremely prescient discussion. USERF has recommended that the US government incorporate protections for uh, religion, freedom of religion or belief into the US supported peace negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban, emphasizing to Afghan political leadership the close relationship between religious freedom and overall security. We also recommend that the US Congress should appropriate funding specifically for the protection of freedom of religion or belief in Afghanistan and to continue oversight activities of these expenditures. With these recommendations, we hope the Sikh and Hindu communities who are nearing extinction in Afghanistan and are forced to flee to neighboring India where they reportedly endure further discrimination are instead able to maintain their existence in their indigenous land and continue to make contributions to their homeland as citizens in Afghanistan. To understand better the Hindu and Sikh plight, we would like to show you a short clip of a documentary called Mission Afghanistan, courtesy of Pritpal Singh, an Af Afghan Sikh, who fled during the Civil War during the early 90s, but returned to his native country to document what remains of his people and their culture in Afghanistan. We're going inside the temple, the Hindu mandir in Jalalabad. And the gentleman just told me that they have uh, more or less 25 people, Hindu, Hindus living in Jalalabad. And, uh, have a look at the mandir. Please come in. Jalalabad <laughs> Seeing this Darga and uh, meeting up a few people, Hindu people in this temple, I feel really saddened. I think the, the population of Hindus in this country is gonna extinct in a very, very near future. I can already see it's happening here in Jalalabad, where they just got two, three families. 
in maybe two, three, four years, five years down the road, probably there'll be no one to, to look after these, uh, these beautiful uh, place of worship. Is. So I'm, I'm really sad about that. Thank you, Preepal Singh, for giving you, sir, permission to use uh, this short clip of your documentary. And now for a more detailed understanding of the ongoing issues Afghan Hindus and Sikhs face in Afghanistan, I would like to turn to our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Jagbir Juti Johal from the University of Birmingham. The floor is yours, Dr. Johal. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak on an important issue in this important year of remembrance for Americans, the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, but also the withdrawal of troops from Af Afghanistan. As a community, Sikhs and Hindus have been impacted by the repercussions of 9-11 globally through race hate crime due to mistaken identity. The repercussions of foreign policy interventions to curb Taliban power has also had a negative impact on the Sikh and Hindu communities in Afghanistan. And we hear today just that there has been an attack in Jalalabad in the, in the area of the Gurdwara where some Sikhs may have been injured. Sikh and Hindu presence in Afghanistan has steadily collapsed due to extremist fundamentalist intolerance and they hardly make the blip on the screen of current concerns. Unless it is a massive attack like the one that occurred in March last year, uh, while, uh, uh, like last year, while other more pressing issues, which are in fact the primary cause of the decline of Hindu and Sikh presence in Afghanistan, attract far more attention. Whilst Hindus and Sikhs are routinely identified with the Indian subcontinent, it is easy to conclude that the Hindus and Sikhs found in Afghanistan must by definition be foreign migrants. However, this is not the case. They are made up of those members of the indigenous population who aligned themselves with the teachings of Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh tradition, during the course of the 15th century. The Hindus and Sikhs of Afghanistan are in no sense Indian, rather they are a distinct component of the indigenous population of the core of the region, which has recently come to be described as the Afpak region, which had formed an integral component of the social order of this region until the 70s. The last five decades, whether it, is, uh, it was under the Soviets, the Mujahideen, Taliban, or the leadership of Pre President Ghazi or President Ashraf Ghani, Sikhs and Hindus, amongst other minorities, have seen their non-Muslim religious identity result in violence and discrimination. With the Mujahideen, Hindus and Sikhs of Afghanistan found themselves in severe difficulty and greater difficulty still when the militant Islamic, Islamist Taliban swept to power in the 90s. The tolerance of diversity evaporated in the face of the hardline jihadi and fundamentalist attitudes promoted by the Taliban. For example, they had to pay a tax, the jihaz, a religious tax for their non-Muslim status, wear a piece of yellow cloth in public or mark their homes and businesses with a yellow label mark to identify identify their religious identity. Muslims at large were strongly encouraged to avoid using their shops, destroying their livelihoods and ability to support family. In these circumstances, the overthrow of the Taliban regime was widely welcomed. But to this day, Sikhs and Hindus continue to attract the hostile attention of the resurgent forces of the Taliban and the appearance of ISIS, uh, ISIS-K in Afghanistan. Once again, they are being asked asked to pay jihaz by the Islamic State. In some regions such as Ghazni, physical attacks on religious life cycle practices such as cremations and religious articles of faith such as the men's long hair and turban remain a constant threat. And this is only getting worse as the withdrawal of American troops fast approaches. Attacks in 2020 and 2021 are testimony to that. They are intent on destroying a shared cultural history and removing all evidence of others. This brings to mind 2001, when the Taliban destroyed the two giant Buddhist statues that presided over the Bamiyan Valley in central Afghanistan for more than 15 centuries. To quote Yusuf's 2021 annual report, the Afghan Afghanistan chapter, quote, driven by societal discrimination, influenced by extremists, Sikhs and Hindus are subject to harassment, including physical assaults, abduction, 
land grabbing, looting, and pressure to convert. The Hindu and Sikh population dropped from about 250,000 in the early 1990s to less than 1,000 in 2019. After the 2020 Kabul Godwar attack and kidnapping of Sachdev, the number dropped to around 200, a near extinction of the once robust community. Members of the Sikh and Hindu community have felt pressured to leave Afghanistan due to the lack of safety and security in the face of ongoing targeted attacks on their leadership and houses of worship by militant groups. As a researcher with a special interest in sexual violence, gender, children's rights, and mental health, it is clear that for those remaining in Afghanistan, the fear for the safety of Sikh and Hindu women and young girls is very real. While men, whilst men suffer from verbal and physical abuse in public places due to their external identity, Sikh women also fear this, and Sikh and Hindu women and girls remove themselves from the male gaze or keep themselves under the radar by either remaining indoors or covering themselves entirely in a burqa when in public due to the fear of abduction or attack. In July 20, uh, 20 Salmeet Kaur, a 13-year-old girl, was allegedly lured into marriage by a Muslim man and, uh, and was rescued after a local cleric refused to solemnize the marriage because she was a minor. Whilst this case was public, one must ask how many more have happened we do not know because the violence is not spoken about or highlighted publicly due to notions of honor, izzet, and shame. Women and girls are heavily traumatized. Young girls have limited or no education and fam families worry about their future prospects. With men being killed, women's ability to survive and thrive is limited by their lack of personal and financial independence, an issue that must be addressed. They are reliant on diaspora support. Children are affected by persecution and discrimination, particularly their health and education. Religious minorities in Afghanistan find themselves unable to send children to school due to discrimination and bullying by teachers and fellow students. The last place of refuge for many amongst the last few hundred Sikh families who have been forced out of their houses is the Gurdwara, but even there they are not safe. And this sometimes gets lost in the conversations of impact. On the 25th of March, 2020, ter uh, terrorists from the I ISIS-K stormed the Gurdwara Guru Harai Sahib in Kabul's Shor Bazaar, also a housing complex, killing at least 25 people and injuring eight. The disdain for non-Muslim practices is evident when the militants then attacked the cremation funeral ceremony of the victims killed in the Gurdwara attack. Attacks targeting sacred sites and worshippers are intolerable and outrageous acts of terror, and they are acts intended to break communities, especially their dignity. In the, after, in the aftermath of the aforementioned incidents, on March 28, 2020, Sikh news agency reported that ISIS-K threatened Sikhs and Hindus with forced conversion to Islam or expulsion from Afghanistan within 10 days after which time the community would be further targeted. In June, insurgents reportedly kidnapped Sikh community leader Nidan Singh Sechdev at Thali Siri Guru Nanak Sahib Godwara at Fachke, his province. Sechdev, who was a defined as a Nanak Banti follower of Guru Nanak's teachings, was released due to government pressure and was among the first group of Afghan Sikh and Hindu community members who were granted legal entry to India in 2020. This raised concerns for me then, but also now when we are hearing that Sikhs have returned from India back to Afghanistan. Ransom attacks are also prevalent and they are dependent on a stereotype that Afghan Sikhs and Hindus are wealthy. They once were influential members of the commercial community in Afghanistan, but since the 90s, many have lost their businesses and those that were wealthy have left for India or the West. Therefore, those that are left are dependent on financial support from the diaspora because their businesses are discriminated against or they cannot get jobs. Attacks on religious minority communities are part of the strategy and effort by supporters of ISIL or Taliban ideology to weaken and destroy the very religious and cultural fabric of these communities and ultimately erase any evidence of their long history and existence in Afghanistan. 
It is important to note that Sikhs and Hindus have been subjected to persecution for many years in Afghanistan, and the government, which has included limited Sikh representation, Member of Parliament Dr. Ankali Kaur and Member of Parliament Narinda Singh Khalsa, have not managed to provide a suitable level of security for the Hindu and Sikh community. There are probably a number of reasons for this, including competing priorities for resources within the country and general level of lawlessness. The gradual and steady decrease in the size of both communities in Afghanistan is playing right into the hands of Islamic extremists, with the Afghan government unlikely to want to invest significant resources to address equality and security issues for the Sikh and Hindu community, because they know they will eventually leave. I say this despite hearing that the Afghan government is offering financial support to recent returnees. Religious minorities remain vulnerable to targeted attacks. The state of Afghanistan continues to fail at curtailing incitement and violence against Sikhs and Hindus. To date, the Taliban has not made a clear statement about how it intends to treat religious minorities if in a coalition government. The drawdown may be accompanied by peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghanistan government. But when we hear Taliban spokespeople discussing plans to Islamize the country, the international community needs to recognize the vulnerability that minorities are exposed by the withdrawal and ensure that their rights and safety are met. And in my opinion, this, only will be, this will only be met by providing them safe settlement in other countries. Finally, repatriation of the remaining 200 or to, to 250 Sikh and Hindu families needs to be considered because their safety cannot be guaranteed by the Afghan government, especially since they are the weaker part in this coalition. More needs to be done by countries such as the US, Canada or UK. I say this, India is problematic for a number of reasons, its own treatment of religious minorities, but also a lack of welfare state. And on that note, I will conclude. But one thing I would like to highlight is that this is the year that for Sikhs, we celebrate the 400th birth anniversary of our ninth Guru, Guru Tegh Bahadur. And I note that Senator Tommy mentioned in the Vasaki address that he was, that Guru Tegh Bahadur was a protector of religious freedoms and um, rights. So has a community, has a global community, we do need to address the religious persecution of these two communities in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Juti Johal. Why don't we turn over to uh, Michael Kugelman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dwight. Um, thanks to you and your user of colleagues for, for including me in this very important discussion. Um, we've heard from Dr. Johal and, and several voices in Afghanistan before that that has so poignantly articulated the plight of these um, imperiled communities in Afghanistan. And so I'll let their words speak for themselves and I'll shift the discussion to the area of US policy. Um, what does the US withdrawal mean for these small vulnerable communities and what can the Biden administration do to help them post withdrawal? Um, the answer to the first question is crystal clear. Uh, the withdrawal will make these vulnerable communities even more vulnerable. It's as simple as that. Assuming the peace process is not re revitalized, and I fear it will not be anytime soon because the Taliban will want to capitalize on the huge battlefield advantage that it gains by a US withdrawal, then uh, instability will intensify and militant groups will enjoy more space to plan and mount attacks. But Quite honestly, even if by some minor, minor miracle, the peace process were to get back on track anytime soon and result in a ceasefire, well, you know, I think as we all know, that wouldn't necessarily help the plight of these communities. And that's because you know, several of the groups, and specifically one of the groups that has been very active in targeting these communities, here I'm thinking about ISIS, you know, would not abide by a ceasefire. Uh, ISIS is not part of the peace and reconciliation process and it never will be. Um, so what can the US government do to help these communities? What options does it have? I'll offer a few, um, reflect, a few brief reflections. First, and I'm gonna be very candid here, uh, the prioritization 
of human rights and minority rights in Afghanistan has never really been a top policy priority for the US, uh, the, U the US government. The US has actually struggled to articulate its main strategy for Afghanistan in recent years on the whole. It began as a counterterrorism focused mission, and that's how it's been defined over the most recent years. And that CT lens is also what prompted President Biden to make his decision to withdraw. So unfortunately, in the context of this discussion this afternoon, these issues are not foremost on the minds of US officials right now. Uh, post withdrawal, the US focus will be on maintaining a counterterrorism capacity. And that is actually, I think, a good thing in this context, which I'll get uh, to in a moment. The other main US focus will post withdrawal will be on maintaining diplomatic support for this badly floundering peace process. Now, to be sure, the administration will publicly emphasize its continued commitment to help promote uh, human development and human rights in Afghanistan, including minority rights. So, uh, you know, some of you may have seen the fact sheet that was re released by the White House after President Ghani's visit uh, to, to Washington last week. It stated, quote, our strong support and partnership is designed to protect the rights of women, girls, and minorities, unquote. It all, this fact sheet also speaks of continued humanitarian assistance that targets Afghanistan's most vulnerable, but there are not really that many specifics um, of how specifically this aid will be used and who the recipients will be uh, beyond girls and, and women. Now, even if this aid for vulnerable groups is to be obliged, committed, I think it's going to be increasingly difficult to oversee that assistance. Um, with no US security presence in the country, and with violence sure to pick up, it's going to be difficult for, um, for those charged with responsibility for aid to manage this funding on the ground, to manage activities on the ground. And while the Taliban certainly will not obstruct and oppose certain forms of international assistance, such as that used for, say, infrastructure projects, um, it's certainly not going to be an easy sell on the idea of helping facilitate the delivery of assistance for religious minorities in Afghanistan. And the sense I get more broadly is that the Biden administration recognizes the huge risks to human rights and minority rights post withdrawal, but that it's so focused on the withdrawal itself right now, uh, and will continue to be so over the next few uh, months, next few weeks, that it hasn't really thought things through in terms of how to try to safeguard those rights post withdrawal. So this is why the issue of US counterterrorism capacity post withdrawal is critical. I think it'll be increasingly difficult to be in a position to provide more direct assistance to religious uh, minorities uh, in Afghanistan, particularly those that are uh, especially small and, and endangered and imperiled. But it is in a position, the US is in a position to go after those, or at least some of those that target these communities. ISIS will be a major focus of US post withdrawal counterterrorism activities. And ISIS, unfortunately, always has uh, religious minorities in the crosshairs, including the ones that we're discussing today. It's not yet clear, though, what the US CT capacity post withdrawal will look like. But what is clear is that no matter how it shakes out, this capacity, the, the US CT capacity, will be degraded. It's very tough to boast a, uh, a, CT, a robust CT capacity in a country when you don't have a formal security presence in that country. So for now, the plan is to use existing U.S. bases in the Middle East and in the Middle East to launch air flights, including drones, into Afghanistan to conduct surveillance for the movements of terrorist uh, organizations. And presumably, those those existing bases in the Middle East could, will be used to um, uh, launch operations resulting in airstrikes on terrorist targets in Afghanistan. But it's a lot more inefficient to do that when you have to fly so far from the Middle East to do it. And for reasons I won't go into, I think it's going to be very difficult for the US to conclude new basing arrangements in countries neighboring Afghanistan, which would facilitate its post withdrawal counterterrorism activities. Uh, there certainly is the possibility that some US security personnel, beyond the soldiers that will be staying to protect diplomats, will quietly stay in order to conduct covert activities. That's certainly a possibility. But this is unclear, especially in terms of numbers, if, if, there, is, if there will be this residual covert um, presence. So um, the US will continue to target the groups, or at least some of the groups that terrorize religious minorities, including the Sikh, the Sikh and the Hindu communities in Afghanistan. But its capacity to do this will be significantly degraded. Um, I certainly think, and I think this repeats what was said earlier, 
there's a very important role for the diaspora communities of Afghan Hindus and Sikhs to play in terms of building awareness, and especially with the, the legislatures in their, in, their, um, in their adopted countries or new countries, so that there is more pressure on governments, certainly the US government, but others too, to focus more assistance directly on religious minorities in Afghanistan. And this is a tough thing to do because, <clears throat> pardon me, I fear that Afghanistan will sadly go off the radar in many world capitals once the withdrawal is complete, except when there's a horrific terrorist attack or something like that, it's gonna go off the radar. Um, with so many horrible things happening to so many vulnerable and marginalized communities around the world, both in Afghanistan and beyond, it's, it's very difficult to focus global attention on one specific vulnerable group or groups uh, in Afghanistan, especially those that are, so, that are so small in number. But it's still necessary to try, for sure. And these diasporas can certainly find allies around the world, sympathetic legislators, and especially those legislators that represent districts that have a notable, a notable presence of, uh, of Afghan Hindus or Sikhs or Hindus and Sikhs uh, on the whole in their, in their districts. Human rights groups, of course, are always keen to focus on these issues. And uh, naturally, USERF um, and its equivalents in other countries are always important interlocutors in this case. They stand ready to assist with awareness building and other activities. The ultimate goal, I think, in the US at least, is to generate enough attention around the plight of Sikhs and Hindus um, in Afghanistan, including by working with those on Capitol Hill, so that any future assistance packages to Afghanistan can specifically identify smaller religious minority communities as intended uh, recipients. Um, now, of course, another issue is the extent to which the Afghan government is committed to trying to better the plight of vulnerable religious minority communities. And in that regard, um, you know, it has a bit of a checkered record uh, on this uh, issue. In that regard, perhaps some conditionality can be in order. Aid is really Washington's sole remaining potent tool of leverage vis-a-vis -vis Kabul and vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban for that matter. Uh, you know, the fact that so many that, that US troops are on their way out, that really deprives the US of what had been its main tool of leverage. So one recommendation looking forward would be for the US to threaten to curtail level, levels of future military assistance to Kabul if it cannot ensure that more is being done to provide protection, financial assistance, education, health resources, and so on to these um, marginalized communities, all in an effort to make these communities feel safer and less discriminated against. Because as we've heard, it's not just a matter of these, of, of Afghan Sikhs and Hindus getting, getting attacked, but it's the general uh, state of affairs that they experience, the structural levels of discrimination, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so I will end there and, and look forward to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to our two uh, expert panelists for prov providing such uh, insight and context. Uh, before I launch into a uh, question uh, for, for the uh, panelists, uh, I just want to remind the audience uh, to feel free to ask a question by using that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as possible, dwindling population uh, of these two communities, but to also acknowledge certainly that, and there was a reference to the Hazara Shia community, also there's Christian converts who face the, uh, the scrutiny of uh, the extremists, uh, including the Taliban, um, and a small unrecognized Baha'i community, among others. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of diversity uh, religiously uh, there in uh, Afghanistan. My question really gets to the point of this, this idea of a power sharing agreement with the Taliban. We, we, we know the images in the 90s when they came to power, what uh, the plight of women and girls faced. Uh, uh, we certainly do, and you referenced that, uh, Michael, uh, in terms of U.S. Uh, support there. Minorities get listed, but it's, it's not clear. There's a very clear record by the Taliban uh, of the way they've approached through their ideology and through their actions, how they've treated uh, religious minorities across the board, uh, women and girls. Um, if there is a power sharing agreement, uh, what is the fate of Hindus and Sikhs and other religious minorities uh, in in the country, we, uh, we 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 know there are problems and extreme problems already when the Taliban is not part of a uh, agreement. But can you talk to us a little bit about what what's in the offing here if that happens? I'm I'm happy to start. Um, uh, I think that it's a very important question. 
uh, I think that it's, it's quite striking, though not surprising, that the Taliban has been consistently vague about what type of provisions and rights it would provide for uh, Afghans if they're to be in power. Essentially, it's default response whenever it's posed this question about human rights, minority rights, is that we'll, you know, so long as, uh, as, as it reflects Islamic uh, law, we're fine with it. But it's so vague that it's hard to know what they mean. And I think that, you know, certainly the, the Taliban's track record, as you noted, does not portend well in this regard. If you take into account the areas of Afghanistan today that are controlled by the Taliban and which have, there have been a number of researchers and journalists that have gone into these areas, sort of a mixed record, but uh, it seems like the, the bottom line is that, um, you know, you do not have a, uh, the type of, of system that you, would, that you would prefer. In some cases, women do appear to have more of a public role than they had previously when the Taliban was in control. Uh, younger girls have been going to school, and I emphasize younger girls. So in, in these Taliban-controlled areas, you are seeing perhaps some advances, but it's no indication that, that the Taliban will go out of its way to uh, do a better job of, of supporting these groups that it has terrorized, uh, not necessarily very recently, but, but in the past. So unfortunately, I'm not optimistic, and I fear that uh, given the leverage that the Taliban would have and given the upper hand it would have in talks, I think it'll be very difficult for Kabul and the U.S. and other stakeholders to try to push these these net, these important issues like minority rights and try to get the Taliban to sign on to that. The power symmetries are very significant in the Taliban's favor. Um, I'll, I'll come in there. I, I think Michael is right. I don't think the position of religious minorities will be guaranteed or, or in terms of their safety and in terms of educational or em, employ, employ, employment access. Um, because we've seen there's been a track record over the last five decades of the situation that these religious minorities have had to experience. And I, I from everything that has been discussed and how even the Afghan government is dealing with the tran transition or the drawdown, I don't think there's the focus has been that much on the religious minority communities. And I know that the um, uh, Afghan government is, pay, is, is giving money in terms of aid to those returnees from um, India at the moment who are coming back to Afghanistan. Um, they have said that they will um, restore the uh, restore 18 Godwaras, for example, within Afghanistan, i.e. Re uh, rebuild them and everything um, through, I think it's called something, um, through, oh, th there's a department of the Hajj or something, the, the Ministry of Hajj, that they, they would utilize that money from there to protect and to rebuild the places of worship. This is all talk at the moment. For the past five decades, we haven't seen any of this action. We haven't seen them protect Sikhs. Sikhs cannot uh, cremate their dead without fearing for their own lives. So if you cannot do that, you, if your own police officers are, are being bribed or whatever, you cannot say that once troops are, are out of Afghanistan, that the Taliban and the, the Afghan government will work together to protect the minorities. I don't see that on the cards at all at the moment. Well, it sounds, I mean, it sounds like from some of the comments uh, thus far, I mean, when we're talking about such a small number in the, in the hundreds left of particularly the Sikh and Hindu communities, is this a foregone conclusion? that these communities are, are no longer going to exist in the near future? or And I think that Michael alluded to what could be done to some degree, but frankly, are we talking about an Afghanistan five, 10 years down the line that will no longer have Sikh or Hindus living in the country? Should I jump in? I'll jump in there. I think there won't be. Um, and, I'm, I, and I don't like to say that because that is their homeland. That is where they are from. But with their safety not being guaranteed um, and they not being given the right access to education, employment and everything, their future chances are being limited and destroyed. So the only option that Sikhs and Hindus have is to leave Afghanistan unless the Afghan government guarantees that they will provide the educational and employment um, access that will guarantee them a better future. And that uh, I can't see happening. And even if there are gestures being made now, 
if the coalition between the Afghan government and the Taliban fails, what happens then? So I'm, it's not done, done deal. Michael, did you want to comment at all on that? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, all I can do is agree with Dr. Johal's very um, downcast uh, projection. I think this is this is very much true. I think it's going to get to a point where the only um, the only uh, the, the only choice is to leave. But I think that uh, you know these these types of communities they sort of reflect this quintessential um, plight of the most marginalized, troubled uh, communities in the world that they're not safe at home. But then they're not safe when they leave, um, you know, because we've heard, I mean, Afghan refugees on the whole have had a very difficult time of it. Many have tried to leave the country. They've tried to go to Pakistan, Iran, others have gone to Europe. Many have not had luck. They've had to come back. So I think this is just, it's, it's so even if they think that their only choice is to leave, which it may be, that doesn't necessarily ensure that things are going to get completely better. So it really is a very troubling state of affairs. Do I, can I just jump in there? Yes, please. One thing I think I would like to highlight is that those Afghan Sikhs who left Afghanistan last year for India, they, they weren't safe in India. They didn't have the rights or the opportunities there afforded to them to live their life um, uh, well. And so some of those Afghan Sikhs are returning back to Afghanistan. So can you imagine the, the turmoil that they must be from leaving from one situation entering into another, thinking that they will be safe and they will be protected, learning that they aren't, and then having to think, well, the only way I'm going to be safe is returning back to Afghanistan. Just the... Yeah. And I think very briefly to that point about India, um, I think it's very significant that we're talking about India in this context, because as we all know, very recently, India came out with a new citizenship law, which has which has prompted some criticism from 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 folks, including you, sir, because it appears to discriminate against Muslims. But that law appears to be meant to help these types of communities. It tries to facilitate or expedite fast track citizenship for um, religious minorities from neighboring countries. So I think that's an interesting question as to whether that law could, in some way, end up helping these folks better, those that that are in India or those that try to come to India. I don't know, but it's, it's something to consider. Yeah, thank you for uh, touching on that. Uh, and before I uh, turn to some audience uh, questions, I wanted to turn to uh, Chair Manza or Commissioner Davey in case you had a, a burning question or a comment this time. Um, yeah, I was, I was just curious. I know we've mainly focused on, of course, these two communities, um, but, but are, are Christians and Baha'is and others facing similar type of fears as they're coming up to this, um, watching the US pull out? Um, I, I, I can't be completely sure, but I, I would say that any religious minority at the moment in Afghanistan must be fearing for their own safety with the withdrawal of the troops and what the, what the potential outcome can be if the Taliban does get overall rule. I think that so long as uh, ISIS K remains present, the, you know any of these groups will be um, will be targets. They will always be vulnerable, just given the way ISIS functions and the way it looks at threats. I mean, the, the way it looks at targets, everyone is essentially a target for ISIS, and particularly uh, you know religious minorities of any type in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I'm curious if the situation is as clearly it's as dire as it, uh, we've heard um, it laid out. Um, and India seems to be at least somewhat sympathetic to having these groups, uh, having the Sikh and the Hindus um, uh, perhaps find a home there. Should there be more done on that side? Of the border then should more work be done with india if the conclusion is the opportunity for a safe existence uh, for these communities uh, does not exist or will not exist in afghanistan should more be done on with with the indian government yes i i think so uh, sort of gets to the point that i made before given that india recently came out with this new law that is meant to help presumably um hindus and, and sikhs from uh, from afghanistan 
And you know, that, is that an area for, for engagement, for dialogue um, involving uh, USARF and others? Uh, perhaps, obviously, it's an extremely sensitive issue uh, on the whole. So one always has to be cautious about these things. But absolutely, if you're looking for a logical destination in the, in the broader neighborhood, I would think that it would have to be India, given that it literally has this law on the table that is meant to assist these, uh, assist these, these, uh, these communities. I'll jump in. I think yes, India is a destination for uh, for for the community, but I I'm a bit cynical with reference to the citizenship bill, um, particularly in terms of its aims, and I also feel that Sikhs has a religious minority within India have difficulties. So then uh, bring in Afghan Sikhs and the difficulty that they will encounter, that's another added layer on what they will experience. But also, one of the things is the Indian government, if they um, invited, well, took the Afghan Sikhs and Hindu, Hindus in last year, they haven't provided them with the support network that, need, that is needed to help them resettle, uh, to settle in India. Um, and Unlike, say, the, for example, the UK or the USA, where we would have those kinds of support networks being provided, there they are being left, well, they were aided by some NGOs and some godwaras, but then they have been left to their own devices. And when you cannot then get a job due to your status or due to the currently due to the COVID crisis, um, you have no other options. So you've just gone from one situation to another. Maybe once um, COVID um, uh, calms down and things improve, things might be better. But at the moment, India, for me, for Sikh, particularly for the Afghan Sikhs, India is not the right destination. Yeah, along those lines, in fact, you know, we heard last month that about 40 uh, Afghan Hindu and Sikh families who migrated to India through the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, were forced to return to Afghanistan. And so uh, perhaps COVID, perhaps some of these other factors, but uh, yeah, this is, this is an ongoing issue. I think that uh, we have to look at a little bit more closely. There is a question that relates to this that I wanna uh, ask from one of the audience members. Is there any interest in the Sikh and Hindu communities of Afghanistan for resettlement? Or is it very clear that everyone wants to stay in Afghanistan and or a return from their countries of first asylum. Do we have some insight on what, what uh, these communities would like to do regarding, do they, do they want to leave? Do they want to go to safety outside the country? I think from my experience of talking to Afghan Sikhs within the UK, but also within Europe, who have family within um, uh, Afghanistan, the majority would like to leave because their safety cannot be guaranteed. They are seeing their children growing up with no education, with, um, with lost opportunities there. And when you're living in fear, the only option really is to find safety elsewhere, unless it can be guaranteed by the government. And at the moment, that doesn't seem as it's going to be done. A related question on that, I mean, uh, articulated uh, uh, by saying, uh, with no plans being articulated by the U.S. government at this time to ensure some level of protection of these religious minorities, do either of you advocate for humanitarian parole or a specific refugee resettlement program along the lines of what we did to get groups out of Vietnam after the war? And this is in the U.S. context. If either of you have any uh, comments on that. Yeah, I think it's a good idea uh, for sure, but I think in all reality, uh, the US government is gonna focus on those that, that worked with the US government and the US military. I think that's quite clear. It's you know, been in the news, what's been happening with the interpreters. It's been hard enough for the US to help those people. And those are the people that the US government really wants to help, understandably. And you know, my understanding is that unfortunately, as the situation gets worse in Afghanistan, as the withdrawal takes place, the violence gets worse, you're gonna have so many different groups saying, well, what about us? Um, and this is a heartbreaking reality because so many of these groups deserve to, to, to live in with, with protection and with security. And many of them are not going to be accommodated um, by the US government. And I think that in terms of the, you know, the Hindu and Sikh communities in Afghanistan, I think it would fall within that category. I think that it, certainly from a moral uh, perspective, it makes a lot of sense. But uh, you know, when it comes down to cold, hard uh, you know, interest in, in politics, I don't see this as, as something viable from the perspective of what the US government uh, could do. 
Yeah, um, I think I agree with that. Um, voices, uh, we heard last year after the attack, um, the now President Biden making comments about providing safety for um, Sikhs and Hindus. But with the withdrawal um, drawdown, that's not appearing in any of the dialogue or the conversations. We're not seeing that. So one, as a member of the community, one does question that. So when you were fighting for uh, being an election and when the incident happened, the atrocity, you kind of highlight the need for providing safety. But now that crunch time has come and you, the withdraw, uh, drawdown is gonna happen, that, that, that's not on the table. Um, and I understand there are priorities that, that have to be met and everything, but this is 250 families, right? US, Canada, UK, Europe, we can accommodate those. And I understand, Michael, that there will be other minorities who will experience the same kind of situation and would want to, to be um, given safety or safe haven. But this is, these are two communities who are gonna face extinction otherwise. And, and something does need to be done. And there is a moral, there is a moral um, duty here. And, I, and I'm thinking of, a, uh, from a Sikh perspective, a, a the, a theological perspective of uh, the well-being of all. And as Sikhs, that's what, we're, what we fight for. But in this situation, nobody seems to be doing that for the Sikh or the Hindu community in Afghanistan. We're having the conversations what is the, the actual tangible things that are going to be done? And we don't have an idea of that. Well, there's along the lines you're talking about, there's some questions related to, you know, what is inevitable here? Are we talking about a genocide in the offing or, or will these groups leave on their own once the withdrawal is complete? Uh, but relatedly, there's a question about, um, you know, who will be the ears and eyes on the ground tracking uh, and documenting the persecution of these groups going forward. Um, does the, do the United Nations or other, other international bodies have enough, uh, you know, documenters? Uh, who are, are they in touch? Are they able to document what might be transpiring? Because as we well know, with other parts of the world, whether it's the Uyghurs in China or the Rohingya in uh, Burma, uh, you know, this happens quickly. We know they're compromised and vulnerable, but, but are there the relevant and uh, uh, groups on the ground who are tracking this? Because you're saying in a way that Hindus and Sikhs are go going unanswered uh, despite the facts, despite the information being available to the relevant uh, government and international bodies. Uh, what, what, would you, what would you say to this? Are there, are there human rights uh, uh, defenders and groups that are able to uh, track this and, and, and keep information uh, flowing if, if things ramp up here? I can, I can start. I, I think that certainly in terms of international monitors, the UN is the logical step just because the UN has that presence. It has been able to maintain a lot of monitoring and reporting of different types of data uh, and things on the ground in Afghanistan. To what extent that's impacted by the worsening uh, security situation after the withdrawal, that remains to be seen. But I think that here is where you know, ideally civil society in Afghanistan would be playing a role. Human rights groups in Afghanistan, you have an independent human rights commission, you have you know, NGOs that are active. But unfortunately, these are the very groups that are getting targeted the most. I mean, we all know about this horrific target killing campaign uh, in which a number of journalists and, um, and democracy activists and others have been, have been killed, um, probably by the Taliban, by ISIS and some other groups as well. So yeah, I mean, the eyes on the ground, they're there, but they're operating under increasingly precarious and perilous um, uh, conditions. So but that's all, but that's the only, those are the only options, I think. Um, and again, the role of the UN beyond the withdrawal is, is unclear as to how much it can do on the ground in terms of doing this monitoring and so forth. Um, I agree with Michael. I, I suppose for the Sikh and Hindu community also, it's the monitoring by, our, by the community outside of Afghanistan. We're noting, um, we're making records of what is happening, what we're hearing and making sure that then this gets to government ears and that people within power have knowledge about what, is, what the experiences are of Sikhs and Hindus on the ground. Um, but 
it, it, but it is, it, but it is difficult, um, particularly when we might be lobbying governments, whether it's in Canada, whether it's in America, whether it's in the UK, but then nothing seems to be done. We can record, we can highlight, but then if nobody's prepared to step up and say, right, we're going to do something, then sometimes the, the, the disillusionment does come in, but we'll continue highlighting, we'll continue making sure that people get to hear about it. But sometimes that talk needs to change into action and that action can only be taken by people in authority who have that power to help relocate these families. You know, one final uh, quick question for, you know, some, some quick responses if possible uh, related to uh, what, you know, given the plight that's well documented, what would it take uh, to become a priority of the U.S. government. I think Michael alluded to it, that it's not, uh, frankly, that human rights and minority rights has never been a policy priority. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's a really strong statement in some ways, given the track record of the Taliban and given the level of human rights uh, abuses over the past 25 years. Um, what would it take uh, to, to get the United States uh, to prioritize this and other partners? Uh, as well, is there is there any avenue, any any, and the question really is there any other best practice that that uh, would be able to be utilized? Um, I, I, I'm I'm not, I'm not sure, but one of the best practices that I saw was um, when some of the Afghan uh, Sikh families were um, given refuge in Canada. And that was a lobbying done by the Sikh community there and everything, and the kind of the sponsoring of the families over. And I think governments, whether they're UK, American or Canadian, they need to think about it. Um, but it also is something that you don't want to leave until actually the situation is that bad. When, say, for example, God forbid, the, a Godwara, which is fully packed with attendees, is attacked and blown up. And then you, do, you have just 50 families left. Are you, it, is, is action only going to happen when the extreme happens? And, you, and how do you then address the community, the worldwide community and say, well, we knew about it, but we couldn't do anything at that point. Yeah, I think it'll be very difficult um, to incentivize the, the Biden administration to make the the Hindu and Sikh communities in Afghanistan a priority. It would, I think it, I'd be more optimistic if you still had a more of a security presence in the country, if the US had that, that security umbrella, that military footprint to give it the confidence to focus on these issues. But the Biden administration, of course, has emphasized that it wants to focus on human rights promotion, democracy mm -hmm. promotion. But I think in the case of Afghanistan, there's going to be um, a lot of limits. But uh, I, I think that we really need to look critically at the international community, certainly the, uh, you know, the diasporas, but also um, others abroad, just because, you know, we talk about trying to bring attention to bring attention of what's going on to the, the, uh, the Afghan government so that it can take action. I mean, I've, honestly, Afghanistan's government does not have the bandwidth to focus on this type of issue now. I wish I were wrong, but, you know, it's dealing with an insurgency, it's dealing with terrorism, it's dealing with political survival, it's also dealing with personal survival in some cases. And unfortunately, I just don't think this register is very high up. And also given some of the documented cases of, of discrimination from those within the government, uh, when it comes to, to, to minorities, I think that's another reason to be skeptical and to lower our expectations as to how much the Afghan government could do. So if you think about the issue of aid conditionality, I mean, that may be one way to get back to this, as I mentioned earlier, but th there's so much on the plate of the Afghan government that unfortunately this issue that we're talking about is just not going to be a priority anytime soon. Well, thank you for your insights. It's a very sobering, uh, I think, way to end, unfortunately, but certainly a lot of food for thought, a lot of ideas. We appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank both of our commissioners, Chair Nadine Mienza and Commissioner Fred Davey, for leading this uh, conversation today uh, of a very urgent uh, issue. And of course, our distinguished panelists, Dr. Jagbir Juti Johal and Michael Kugelman, for sharing their expertise. I also want to thank Naila Mohammed, uh, Yusuf Senior Policy Analyst, who covers uh, Afghanistan and South Asia for the Commission, as well as uh, Kirsten Lavery, our Supervisory Analyst for South Asia. 
and Danielle Ashbahi on our senior communication specialist for helping put together this event today. If you'd like to learn more about USERF's work on Afghanistan, uh, I encourage you to visit our website at www.userf.gov. We certainly plan on hosting uh, other conversations on countries and issues in the months ahead. Uh, so stay tuned. Thanks again for joining us today. And we'll see you next time on USERF uh, Conversations. Have a good afternoon.